But honestly, if you have not taken steps to prepare, I don't think you have a lot of time. But if you took all the people that own silver or think they own silver, I should say, and you compared that to the actual physical metal that exists, there's a huge mismatch because it's been hypothecated and rehypothecated. If we put all the silver that's been purchased on one side of uh, the 50 yard line and we put all the paper that shows ownership on the other side, the mismatch would be huge. Would it be double, triple, quadruple? Would it be 100 times? I don't know that number. What I do know is that if everyone that owns silver actually put it on their front porch or out in their field or whatever, it doesn't match. According to David Morgan, the founder of The Morgan Report, a significant discrepancy exists between the physical silver available and the paper representations of silver ownership. This statement implies that a considerable amount of silver is claimed on paper, but it may not correspond to the actual amount of physical silver. The remarkable increase in silver demand has resulted in a substantial supply deficit. According to the latest World Silver Survey, the silver market experienced a deficit of 237.7 million ounces in 2022, which has been described as potentially the most significant deficit ever recorded. And this is after the 51.1 million ounce shortfall the year prior. Silver is expected to be undersupplied again this year by over 142 million ounces. David sees that the deficit in silver supply has decreased from 2 billion ounces during the Hunt Brothers era to 500 million ounces in 2005. However, the inventory has been gradually increasing since then, but it is now decreasing due to 55% of silver going into industrial use, which has increased over the years. Demand for silver will continue to grow for the next decade, far outpacing its growth over the last 10 years, according to the latest research from Oxford Economics. The report said that industrial demand will continue to dominate the silver market over the next 10 years, with demand from the sector expected to grow by 46%. Furthermore, David points out the issue of hypothecation and rehypothecation in the silver market, where brokers may provide clients with paper representations of silver ownership without holding the physical silver. For instance, cases involving institutions like Morgan Stanley and UBS where such practices occurred. In these cases, Disputes were typically settled in cash rather than delivering the physical silver, which David argues was not in line with the true intent of silver investors, who often seek to hold physical silver as a hedge against the banking system. We will present clips from David Morgan's interview with Liberty and Finance, but before we do, if you want more videos like this, please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for more updates. Thank you and enjoy the video. So the deficit went down from 2 billion ounces during the Hunt Brothers down to 500 million ounces in about 2005. The inventory has actually been building since then, but it is starting to, to offtake rapidly due to 55% going into industrial supply or use. It used to be 35% 20 years ago. So that's increased uh, 20% or um, hasn't doubled, but almost in uh, two decades. And yet the silver supply has increased from 20 years ago, 550 million ounces to 800, 850 million ounces. So in other words, it's almost doubled in use during the same time that the supply was increasing. Now, the supply has remained around the 800 million mark for a long time, you know, 15 years. That's a long time to me, you know, in a person's lifetime. So what's go what it's going to take is the truth. And here's the truth. The way I see it. Now, can I prove this? I could prove it if we could accomplish what I'm about to say. The silver market was probably cornered 20 years ago. And I was going to make this my speech at the Silver Symposium in Las Vegas. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get there. But if you took all the people that own silver, or think they own silver, I should say, and you compared that to the actual physical metal that exists, there's a huge mismatch because it's been hypothecated and rehypothecated. I'll give you a few examples. It's uh, something I've put up on my Twitter. Or maybe I'll do it after this interview if I can find it again. But um, Morgan Stanley settled a lawsuit because one of their bigger investors was buying silver through them and storing it with them for quite some time. And somehow or other, he got wind of the fact that maybe his broker wouldn't let him see his own silver or you know see the vault or whatever. It turned out that Morgan Stanley never bought any silver and they didn't even have a vault. But during the discovery process and into the court record, to the best of my knowledge, the 
defense for Morgan Stanley was that it was standard practice in the industry. In other words, it was standard practice to give your client a piece of paper that showed what their silver purchase was and it was being stored when they had never bought any silver, maybe they didn't even have a storage facility. Now, if that doesn't send chills up and down your spine as a big silver investor, I don't know what will. So my point is that we probably bought enough silver to actually take the price higher because you price is the arbitrator of supply and demand, if and only if it's accounted for properly. And it isn't. There's more than Morgan Stanley example with UBS. There's been others. And in every case that I've been able to see so far, and I used to keep a pile of paper on my desk, which I finally gave up on, on these type of situations, and they always get settled in cash. So in the Morgan Stanley occurrence, they just made everybody whole by paying them the paper price of silver or what they paid for the silver, which is radically wrong because people buy silver to be out of the banking system, or at least to hedge it. You might have a bank account, but you've got you know, 5% of your net worth in silver. So they should settle in silver. I mean, that would make it right, right? All animals are equal, right? Same rules, laws, and accountability. I bought silver. Give me the silver. You know, we had one with a, a major depository that was uh, used a lot of IRA money that was gold deposits and silver deposits uh, for their IRAs. And guess what? They didn't have all the gold and silver that was there. I put that on my Twitter account as well. This is much more pervasive than you think. The banking turmoil of March 2023 was a significant incident in the U.S. financial system that threatened to create a general macroeconomic problem. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York staff, while the U.S. banking sector is stable, growing vulnerabilities leave at least some institutions under a near-term threat of funding pressure and capital shortfalls. David asserts that the system has been fundamentally broken for quite some time. He points out that the entire banking system would crumble if a mere 5% of depositors simultaneously requested their funds. This scenario is particularly worrisome because most people leave their money in the bank, engaging in transactions that involve the movement of funds from one bank to another. According to a Treasury report released Friday, the U.S. government spent $659 billion this year paying off the interest on its debt as the nation's widening fiscal imbalance and the Federal Reserve's rate hikes dramatically raised the federal cost of borrowing. David challenges the notion that U.S. Treasuries are the safest global investment, pointing out that the U.S. struggles to repay its debt and faces instability due to rising interest rates, which can lower bond prices. This risks the financial system, especially given the world's dependence on the U.S. dollar. Let's get back to the interview. The other point is how stable is the banking system? Well, it's broken. It's been broken for a long time. If 5% of the depositors at any given time came to their bank and said, I want my cash, the, the whole system would collapse. So if you've got, uh, you know, whatever, 5,000 in the bank and you want to withdraw 250 and everybody that has whatever amount their deposit is or the deposit, because it's their money, came to the bank and withdrew what they consider their deposit, 5%, take the bank down. But most people just keep it in the bank and then it's in their bank transaction. It goes from one bank to another bank to another bank. And that's the way the system is set up, and it works. And the likelihood of a bank run isn't very likely, but it's not improbable. And it is a possibility. And especially with what happened in the 2008 financial crisis, you remember Senator, and it starts with a K, I can't pronounce his name very well, but he talked about an electronic run on the banks, that so many billions of dollars were flooding in that the Fed had to step in and do something. Well, that's the case again, only it's been a slightly slower process where many depositors have moved out of the bank and into money market funds. So the deposit base is a lot less in the banking system itself. So that puts greater stress. But the greatest stress is the way the system is set up. And the way the system is set up is the idea that the safest investment on the planet is in the United States treasuries or U.S. debt. And this is an absolute fallacy because right now it's impossible to pay back that debt. And it's getting to the point where it's almost impossible to pay back the interest on that debt. And because of that fact, you have a very unstable system. But above and beyond that, as we've all know, or anyone that follows me or you has learned or knew already, that when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. 
So right now, the whole basis of the system is based on the United States dollar and the short, intermediate, and long term. What is it worth in a six-month T-bill? What is it worth in a 10-year uh, <clears throat> stalwart? What is it on a 20- or 30-year bond? So I've got news for most of you that don't follow the bond market very closely. Number one, it's about six times bigger than the equity markets. So all of the GDP of all the nation states in the world, multiply that by five or six, and you've got an idea how big the debt market is. So it far surpasses the, the entire productivity of the world. And it's far more important because of that fact. Well, the point I'm making, and this is, I can't stress this stronger than I am, and that is that on the long bond, it's down about 50%, which means it's lost half of its value. If all the banks had to mark to market, what their reserves are, they're cut in half for many banks that, that loaded up on the long bonds like this we you mentioned at the beginning. So if the stock market was cut in half, literally in a matter of months, you know, there'd be, it would be news. Even the mainstream financial press would be talking about it probably nonstop, or at least for a few days. But no one really talks about the bond market, yet it's much more important. Global silver demand hit a record 1.24 billion ounces, increasing by 18% last year. However, a disconnect between paper claims and physical silver has led to supply deficits, suggesting potential future challenges for the silver market. What are the implications of rising global silver demand and supply deficits in the silver market? Share your observations in the comments section below. Also, ensure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.